physical talent everywhere. Her determination to be perfect was phenomenal. A Two of the greatest athletes of our time reveal the triumphs and turmoil of their lives. I have a feeling that a lot of people don't know how many medals I won in 76, but they know about that 10. Coming up, Nadia Komenich and Katarina Witt talk about their legendary careers. And I won the Olympics because I was just better than anybody else there. Life behind the Iron Curtain. You live in a communist system, you're terrorized. They watched over me like everything. And how they made America a second home. I feel like I was born here. Join us now as Nike presents A Passion to Play. The lives of Katerina and Nadia. Nadia Komenich was 14 years old when she became the first person to score a perfect 10 in Olympic gymnastics competition. Katerina Witt won her first gold medal at the 1984 Olympics in Sarajevo, her second at the 1988 Games in Calgary, and competed in her third Olympics in 1994. I'm Leslie Visser. Today, Katerina and Nadia talk candidly about growing up in Eastern Europe. Remember back then, we weren't supposed to like their athletes, but these two took the chill out of the Cold War. They came from a part of the world that produced some of the greatest athletes ever. Today, a closer look into the lives of Katerina Witt and Nadia Komenich. Katerina still calls Germany her home, and though she's constantly traveling, she tries to go back whenever she can. Walking through the outdoor market in what used to be West Berlin, Katerina has total freedom, something that seemed foreign a few years ago when the city was divided. She lives in the same Berlin apartment, though now the view is quite different. Well, actually, I moved into this apartment uh, when the wall was still up. So when I was looking out, I would see a wall here, and then the grass in the middle, and then the wall on the other side, and then would see West Berlin there. The city is not the same as it was back then, and neither is Katerina. It was really positive that the wall came down and um, to be able to keep going with my career. All of a sudden, all the possibilities opened up for me and I was free to make my own decisions. She could take advantage of offers to do commercials. Product endorsements. How's it doing? Like those and the skates as well. And TV appearances. Ego. Showing German audiences a different side of the Ice Princess. Photos, where I think, hoppla, da ist. She even began her own production company, hosting, starring in, and producing a skating special for German television. I think for me it's like a step forward after being on the ice all the time, but being in, involved in production, seeing you know how a TV production is done, how things are developed, I just thought I want to try it too. Many things have changed in Germany, including the name of the town where she grew up. Karl Markstadt is now Chemnitz. And not far away in her apartment in Berlin, Katerina remembers life in East Germany. It was my home. And um, I got support. I got the good parts out of it, you know. And of course, I would realize later on there's something wrong in this country. Not everything, you know, you can believe what they tell you. But it's the same here. You cannot believe everything somebody tells you. Nadia Komenich has lived in Norman, Oklahoma for the past four years with business partner and fiance, gymnast Bart Connor. The two have become almost inseparable. Except on weekday afternoons when Nadia takes time to watch her favorite soap opera. I start to watch the soap opera because, because of the Nadia team. My favorite character is Victoria. She's been all the time through a rough time and she makes bad decisions. She always do things not good, not very smart, but she ends up being, you know, the one that everybody wants to see her. So it's kind of pretty much like me. <laughs> Today, Nadia and Bart share a professional gymnastics career. When they're in Norman, they oversee the Bart Connor Gymnastics Academy. But more often than not, they're traveling around the world performing in exhibitions, endorsing products, and making television appearances. For the vegetables, we're going to put them in a oak. How, what do you say that is? 
Oak. Walk. I say walk. Okay, put it in the oak. Today, Nadia enjoys the post-Olympic career she never had in Romania. Since moving to the United States, she's been able to profit from her celebrity status and find satisfying ways to invest her earnings. Nadia recently became a sponsor and business partner with the Romanian Gymnastics Federation. These days, it's not unusual to see her accompany the team to major international competitions. I know that uh, they don't have a very, very easy life, and I wanted to, to do something for them for what they did for me. Six years ago, Nadia defected from Romania. She was 28 years old and very different from the Nadia we thought we knew. Nike presents A Passion to Play, The Lives of Katerina and Nadia. Brought to you by Nike, who encourages you to participate in the lives of America's youth. Tampax tampons. Trust is Tampax. Calcium-rich Tums. Tums helps wipe out heartburn and gives you calcium. And State Farm Insurance. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You might see a new star in women's gymnastics right here. Everybody's buzzing about it. Watch your legs here. I've never seen that before. I just don't understand how a 13 and a half year old can have such poise. That four inch wide beam looks like a sidewalk the way she works it. A double twist. Unbelievable. Impossible as it may seem, at the age of 13, she has stunned the gymnastics world by winning the European all around championship. She was a unique personality, a strong willed person, the one who knew what she wants to do, intelligent, powerful physically, and powerful mentally. I never considered myself unique. I just, sometimes I was amazed when I was a kid that uh, I had to learn and I learned things faster than anybody else in the gym. And I didn't know if that was good or not good. Does it bother you to constantly be compared with Olga Corbett? I'm not Olga Corbett, I'm Nadia Komonich. <laughs> Chris, this could be the highlight of the compulsory event. She is one of the technically strongest, best gymnasts that I've ever seen. Watch this. Beautiful rhythm, right to a handstand. Oh, look at that amplitude. Ooh. She is really moving well. Another handstand. Look at that, right to the handstand. Gorgeous. The audience witnessed a flawless performance which even the scoreboard couldn't register. Oh, now they begin to stand here before us. This is the first day of competition. If Nadia had gotten a 9999999, uh, it wouldn't have turned heads. She would have just been this year's Olga Corbin. But because she got that perfect score, it changed everything. Nadia went on to score six more perfect tens. By the end of the game, she had won five medals, three gold, one silver, and one bronze. In two weeks, she became so popular that a song used by ABC Sports during its coverage was given her name. Nadia's theme topped the charts and went gold. From 1975 through 1981, Nadia became one of the most decorated gymnasts in the history of the sport, five Olympic gold medals in all. But it was that first 10 in Montreal that people remember. There are so many athletes at the Olympics and so many winners, but in this first week, there was only one star, a child named Nadia Kamenich. She has an unforgettable face with a commanding presence and her athletic accomplishments speak for themselves. Katerina entered the 1984 Olympics a favorite to win. And the leader now coming into her four-minute long program. This is the name of the game right here. Nice triple go. Here is the smiling countenance of Katerina Witt of East Germany as she accepts her gold medal. By the end of 1984, she was the European, World, and Olympic champion. And by 1988, she was looking for a second gold medal. But it would be a showdown. American champion Debbie Thomas and Katerina both chose music from the opera Carmen. I just thought, well, the judges will decide what they prefer. I always thought that I was trying to portray more the character, like the whole story, you know, where she maybe was choosing more the cheerful part, you know, where 
I died at the end. Katarina became only the second woman in Olympic figure skating history to win back-to-back -back gold medals. That victory, combined with her flashy style, led to a lucrative professional career. Katarina went on to star in a variety of TV specials, ice shows, and a very American commercial. Diet Coke. Ten years after her first Olympic triumph, Katarina decided to make a comeback and compete in her third Olympic Games. Her parents, who'd been supportive, were now leery. At first, we were not happy with her decision to re-enter amateur sports. And in fact, her mother and I thought she had done enough for figure skating. But it was a long road back. She skated poorly in an exhibition where she tested her Olympic program and then placed second in the German Nationals. For the first time, Katerina entered the Olympic Games as an underdog. I have, like, reached every goal I wanted to when I was an amateur. Then, like, so many things came true for me as a professional. I was just looking for a new challenge. Well, 1984, it was my first Olympics. I didn't realize it until afterwards what it means. In 88, I knew what I was going into, and I really had lots of pressure from my country and from myself. And then, coming in 94, I just want to be there. And once I was there, I just wanted to give the best performance I can get. In the 1994 games, Katarina skated to Where Have All the Flowers Gone? An appeal for peace in Sarajevo. And for the first time, her parents were there to see her skate in an Olympics. I thought this moment alone was worth to train so hard, to see my dad and my mom be so happy to be there alive. This fact and figure brought to you by Tampax Tampons. Since 1991, women have outspent men on athletic shoes and fitness equipment. After her 1988 victory in Calgary, Katarina Witt showed almost no emotion. What we didn't know at the time was that the government agreed to let her continue skating professionally only if she won the gold medal. And I, I said, look, I need a commitment from you guys that you allow me that I can continue to skate after this and I'll try to do anything I can that I win the second gold medal. And so there was this pressure because of course, you know, I had to win the second gold medal so they would let me go. And so Katarina continued to enjoy the privileged life of a star athlete, but still had to play hardball with her government. They knew they could lose me if I would not be able to do what I love to do. So they sort of, you know, thought we better let her do what she wants, you know, and uh, then she stays in the country. The East Germans used sports to demonstrate how well everything worked under the communist system. And athletes were urged to join the Socialist Party, as Katerina did when she was 20 years old. She became a favorite of East German leader Erich Honecker. But even so, she was under constant surveillance by the Stasi, the infamous secret police. For years, the Stasi kept thousands of secret files, detailing the actions of anyone the government felt necessary to watch. Katerina was one of them. Ironically, her code name was Flop. They watched over me like everything. I mean, I was under control by telephone being booked, uh, video, taking photos, watching me everywhere. In Katerina's autobiography, she wrote about the secret files, which included a report of sexual intercourse taking place between 8 and 8.07. That was a quickie. <laughs> that was. No, the truth is, it wasn't at all. I was, um, I mean, the whole thing, reading it, the files, I went through different kind of emotions, you know. I was upset, sad, um, just anything you can believe of, and laughing as well, you know, because I thought how ridiculous this whole thing is. The files were made public after the most infamous symbol of communism came crashing down. 
the time, Katerina was out of the country filming a TV special. We just came back from the set and I watched it on TV and I got goosebumps all over and I was ready to jump on an airplane and come here and be here, but it was impossible. But I was quite moved, you know, and I was happy. I was just a little bit thinking, God, what's going to happen? It was a change that took the world by surprise, but it was clear that the end of communism in Eastern Europe was close at hand. Just after the wall came down in East Germany, Romania experienced the bloodiest revolution in Eastern Europe, only weeks after Nadia had defected. I didn't believe that this happening in a country that I used to leave. I was hoping that my family and uh, everybody's alive, because I, and I couldn't contact them at that time. The revolution ended with the execution of President Nicolae Ceausescu. After the 1976 Olympics, Ceausescu awarded Nadia with the country's highest honor. Soon after, he took away her freedom. Pretty soon, um, uh, with the avalanche of uh, foreign um, interests, he did realize how a powerful uh, political tool uh, Nadia can, uh, can turn into if he's going to use it as uh, a positive propaganda, what's going on uh, in his uh, communist country. Suddenly, Nadia's gymnastics activities became more than sport. During the 1977 European Championships, Ceausescu thought Nadia was judged unfairly as he watched the competition on television from Bucharest. So he sent that, uh, a message through the, uh, the Czech ambassador, the Romanian Czech ambassador uh, from Prague to be pulled out that team from that particular um, uh, uh, European Championship and brought home right away. Ladies and gentlemen, a stunning thing has happened here just after Nadia Komenich scored a perfect 10 on the balance beam. She and her two teammates have walked out. I would have won all the medals uh, if I would have stayed, uh, but w w what am I going to do? Ceausescu ordered Nadia to move from Onest to Bucharest, where she would be close to his presidential palace and away from Coach Bella Caroli. Somewhere at the high level, somebody thought that Bella is, uh, is not a Romanian and he's got Hungarian nationality and he maybe he's not good for the intern politics. In Bucharest, Nadia spent what should have been training time attending parties and greeting dignitaries. She arrived at the 1978 World Championships a very different Nadia. Nadia Comaneci completely coming apart on the uneven bars where she thrilled the world in Montreal. She managed to win one gold medal on the balance beam, but it had been a struggle. Within six months of the European Championships, Nadia reunited with coach Bella Caroli, and she won that championship and also the World Cup. But outside the medals and the accolades, her rewards were limited. In, in totally my entire career, for 20 years that I did gymnastics, my entire amount of money that I made uh, was, say, four or $5,000. That was all that I made. Yet she managed to buy a house in Bucharest in an affluent neighborhood not far from the presidential palace. Everybody sees that I have, this is a pretty nice house, but nobody knew that I was sleeping with all my family in a kitchen downstairs because I didn't afford to hit all the house. And I was ashamed of people to, to find out that I, I don't have money. In 1981, Nadia retired from competition and became a coach, a common worker in the communist system. A special trip to the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles would be her last visit to the West. This fact and figure brought to you by State Farm Insurance. Women receive one-third of collegiate athletic scholarship money, which amounts to a difference of $179 million per year. The Sports Machines. The lives of Katerina and Nadia had a common link. Being famous it was not exactly a good thing for me. Uh, even that I thought that probably this is going to help me in my life, I think that this really, really destroyed, uh, destroyed my life at that particular time. The more Nadia made the country proud, the tighter the government's hold became. And after she retired from gymnastics, she began working for the president's son, Niku. But it was rumored that there was more than work involved. It seems they had a relationship, but that's only gossips, you know. Many thought Nadia was forced to be with Niku, but she denies it. Probably he liked 
people to see to see him being involved or you know go to a meeting or present me this is Nadia the Olympic champion but privately Nadia knew she was being used but the thing that it was that frustrated me was that I had never I never got a chance to go as a coach with any of the girls that I I coached because I had no visa. Nobody was giving me any explanation why I'm not allowed to go anywhere and why everybody was going but me. I made a decision here in this house. That's where I told my brother that I think I'm going to leave the country. He said that he thinks that I have no life there in this country. And uh, I'm not going to be left alone to have my own life. Just weeks before the Romanian Revolution in 1989, Nadia defected. She traveled by train from Bucharest to Timisoara, then walked over the Hungarian border in the dead of night. She arrived in New York three days later. Welcome to America! With her was Constantine Panit, the man who helped her defect. He was married and the father of four, and the press questioned their relationship. I didn't know what were the people asked me exactly when they said uh, that I, there was a married man, man who helped me to get out of the country. Uh, what, uh, the people who are married cannot help other people. Even if it were a misunderstanding, her liaison with Penny damaged her reputation. It was very hard for me because it was a particular time when I thought there was, there's no place in the world that I can be happy. Later that same year, Nadia was reunited with American gymnast Bart Connor. She had met him 14 years earlier at a gymnastics competition. Soon, her life would change dramatically. Katerina leads the glamorous life of an international celebrity, but sometimes the brightest star also makes the biggest target. After politics changed in East Germany, attitudes changed too. The public came to resent athletes like Katerina, who supported the old regime and accepted its favors. In the days following the revolution, right after the war came down, there were many negative headlines, especially in East Germany, in which she was described as a party stooge. People just trashed her. People, you know, she, there was one point that she got on stage and she was booed. You know, people booed her in East Germany at a concert. Because she refused to denounce the fallen government, the people who once tossed her roses now threw her insults. What are they blaming me for? You know, that I didn't stand up? I didn't stand up like many other people who didn't stand up to say anything. And I didn't say anything because I, I wanted to do my sport. The attacks continued. Her lowest moment came when a German newspaper accused Katerina of being a spy for the East German secret police. I read this in the paper and I was just totally devastated about it. I thought, how can somebody just come up with a lie like this? As Katerina's former life took a controversial turn in the new Germany, more problems were in store for her a continent away. In the United States, a fan began stalking her and sending her obscene letters. Katerina eventually confronted him in court, face to face. They, they convinced me to do it. You know, FBI came up to said, to, and they said, you know, there's nothing else we can do except you do it to court and uh, you, you face him. And it might be something what would help for other celebrities at your status as well. And it, it, it helped. Katerina's brave move helped sentence the stalker to three years in a psychiatric facility. And today, away from skating, Katerina leads a more cautious, guarded life. This moment in women's sports brought to you by Nike. The Berlin Wall was built by the East German regime in 1961 to seal the border, keeping the citizens of the German Democratic Republic in and visitors out. Protected and isolated, East Germany became an industrial power, but its most famous product came from what was known as the East German sports machine. Katarina Witt began skating at age five in her hometown of Karl Markstadt. Three years later, she was assigned to the legendary coach, Jutta Mueller. I teach all. I, I help her in all things. 
and I give her, I think I give her a style. All her music sets for me, sets my idea. And, and so I think uh, it was a life together. The government spent about $500 million each year supporting 25 sports schools to groom any athlete who had potential. I had the benefit of it to, to grow up there and to be supported, and I think it was like one of the good parts in East Germany. They used the Olympics to showcase their sports superiority. In 11 Olympic Games, East German athletes won 519 medals. Remarkable results, but tainted by allegations of systematic drug use to enhance performances. Now, I grew up in honestly thinking we never would do that in this country, you know, that nobody would lie about anything. And of course, you would always wonder a little bit. Katarina and other athletes who were members of the Socialist Party publicly showed their allegiance to the government. I was supportive then too, you know, thinking I'm able to get my talent out there, so I was grateful and thankful. When athletes achieved financial success, the system kept most of the money. However, Katarina did receive what were considered privileges, such as her own apartment, a car, and travel outside the country. As long as she continued to win, the resources of the sports machine were available. I would get my treatments every day. I would get my massages every day. And it was all taken care of in my school and just everything. Just to have the whole surrounding with an athletic coach, a ballet coach, a choreographer, where here you have to struggle for everything. The 1988 Olympic Games were the last time the East German sports machine functioned in full force. We never really appreciated it until the wall came down and then everybody was on their own and then you really appreciated how well run the system was. The gold medalist in the ladies event from the German Democratic Republic, Katharina Witt. In 1990, East and West Germany became one and the sports machine became a footnote in the history of the German Democratic Republic. The town of Onest is located in northeastern Romania, an agricultural region that has not changed much over the years, except in 1969 when the Romanian government built the Onest School of Physical Education. The school had a unique program in which children attended classes and received special training in gymnastics. Onest was also the town where Nadia grew up. When she was six years old, she was selected to attend the school. We had a very organized selection procedure. We went to the kindergartens, we went to the schools. They're trying to find those kids, the ones who've been the best uh, fitting for the sport of gymnastics. Smaller ones, uh, dynamic ones, powerful ones, the ones who could promise a uh, great performance in gymnastics. Unlike East Germany, the Romanian government favored gymnastics over other sports. Since 1956, their schools have produced 41 Olympic medals, and all but two were won by women. Critics say their training was too rigorous for young girls. We were taught that time uh, when, when I was competing that we have to say that we train only three, four hours a day, which we didn't. We trained more than that. We spent seven, seven hours in the gym. Probably uh, the Romanians and um, uh, myself was the one who actually initiated uh, the hard and intensive training preparation with younger gymnasts. That's how actually Nadia's generation grew into the international status and they became uh, 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 Olympic uh, champions. Today, the government still supports its gymnastic schools. The Diva School of Physical Education and Sport is the most prominent with about 800 students who range in age and ability. Teenage world champions and four-year-old beginners live, train, and go to school at the same facility. And I think this is uh, one of the secrets of the preparation, to concentrate the best gymnasts and to have, to have every day a competition between uh, this kind of gymnast. And competition means progress. If success is a measure of progress, the Romanian gymnastics schools have fared well. Their team won the 1994 World Team Championships, and they are considered the favorites in the 96 Olympics. This is figure skating, a blade carving patterns in the ice. The figures gave the sport its name, and traditionally were a component of competition. 
but Katarina hated the compulsory figures and preferred to focus on the creative side of skating. I think Katarina's contribution to the sport is not necessarily in her skating, but in her personality and in what she represents and the way she has done it. She's almost like an athletic, voluptuous, sexy Brunhilde. Throughout her early training, Katarina built strength and stamina for the difficult jumps. And later she developed her natural feel for music and dance to become an athletic skater with a decidedly feminine flair. She's brought some real glamour to skating because physically she's so beautiful. And that kind of, you know, softens that really powerful athletic style. There was an aloofness about her. There was a, a mystery about her that, um, that, that, that she used to pull people into skating. Part skater, part storyteller, Katarina developed an image all her own, one that has been criticized as being too sensual and flirtatious. People seem to forget that I have worked so hard to get there. I mean, I didn't work so hard to learn how to flirt, but to skate, you know, to, to able to do the jumps and to keep my nerves together. And I won the Olympics because I was just better than anybody else there. But as a professional, Katarina would capitalize on her charisma. Why, why should I hide it? I mean, I can't, actually, I can't hide it. Her costumes often caused a stir, and in 1988, the International Skating Union revised a bylaw which became known in skating circles as... The Katarina Roy, <laughs> which I think is somehow wrong because I never ever in competitive skating I had costumes which were revealing. I mean, for instance, last year again, I was portraying Robin Hood, and I got, like, opinions where they said, well, do you have to come out in tights? And I was like, excuse me, Robin Hood was not running through the forest in a skirt. Katarina has been skating for 24 years, and within the sport, she found joy while giving others inspiration. I'm still pretty young and looking forward to the rest of my professional career, and if it's half as long as Katarina's, then I'd be very happy. In a sport that demands elegance, perfection, and finesse, at age 29, Katarina is still skating strong. She takes command of the ice. She still has that. She's the legendary Katarina Vitt. She was the greatest physical talent ever. Her determination to be perfect was phenomenal. I help to change the sport. Everything has to do with that 10 in 76. Um, it has nothing to do with how many medals. And it has nothing to do with how many golds or silvers. And I have a feeling that a lot of people don't know how many medals I won in 76. But they know about that 10. Before Nadia, the Soviet women dominated the sport. Gymnasts such as Larissa Latininya were considered invincible until 1968 when Vera Cheslavska from Czechoslovakia interrupted their reign. But by 1972, the Soviets were back on top with Ludmila Tereshova winning the Olympic all-around title. I had a picture actually uh, with a signature from her. Somebody gave it to me in one competition and I was carrying that because I knew that there was the, the kind of gymnast that I wanted to, to be like because I like her style. In the 1975 European Championships, Nadia defeated Tereshova. Along with uh, Tereshova also fell a tradition which provided through the years those beautiful uh, Russian and Soviet athletes. Nadia brought in a new tradition and a new era in gymnastics. Her style changed the face of gymnastics forever. All of a sudden we saw someone step out on the floor and perform the most difficult skills, but technically perfect, never losing form throughout. And we now believed we could do that because we had seen it done. Nadia's success in the 1976 Olympics inspired other young girls to participate in the sport and dream of Olympic glory. I idolized Nadia Komenich. I remember watching 76 and I said, Mommy, I said, I'm gonna be in the Olympics. And she patted me on the head and said, sure, honey, sure. Nadia was the epitome of youth and perfection. She could perform moves like no other gymnast ever had. To this day, two moves on the uneven bars are named after her, the Salto Komenich and the Komenich Dismount. The Salto was that by mistake, I was supposed to catch the higher bar, and by mistake, I catched the same bar, and that that was not done either. 
The dismount is a, uh, it was a, a, a pretty much simple dismount that Bella had an idea to turn it half of, uh, half degrees and just do the salto, the back salto. It, it was just a matter of imagination. Gymnastics moves are rated on their level of difficulty, and the Salto Comanich is still one of the most difficult, 19 years after it was performed by a 14-year-old girl. Well, she single-handedly changed the sport. She told the judges, I'm going to do things that you've never seen before, so you're going to have to rewrite the rules. And that's exactly what happened to women's gymnastics after she got all those tens. They said, well, our rules are obsolete now because there are gymnasts who can do things we never imagined were possible. I don't know if I'm going to be able to ad adapt in a, in a new country. And I can say that I, you know, after five years, I consider myself that I feel like I was born here. I miss my friends in Romania, but that ocean that used to be between us is not as big as it, as it was before. Last November, Nadia returned to Romania. It had been five years since she defected, five years since she'd been home. But I come in easier back. <laughs> I mean, probably if I could fly to go there, probably, probably I wouldn't left. I mean, if I would be free to to travel wherever I wanted to, probably it would be different now. But that's the way it is. It's much easier than walking in the night time. Welcome home to Nadia, the queen of the Romanian gymnastics. Nadia been and Nadia will be always a national hero in Romania. Waiting for Nadia at the Bucharest airport were hundreds of fans, friends, and her mother, Stefania. She was the pride of the country. She was the pride, not just of the athletes, but the whole Romanian society. It was Nadia Comaneci day in her hometown of Onest. She had returned to a much more liberated country and a father she hadn't seen in more than five years. They were just screaming Nadia and Nadia and everybody wanted to touch me. Uh... To honor their hero, the Ones Gymnastics School was renamed the Nadia Comaneci School. After greeting old teammates, she went on a tour of the facility where she'd begun her gymnastics career 28 years before. This, this is the room where I used to sleep, mm -hmm. but uh, the bed are not the same. Um, they, after 76, so they renovated everything. Uh, I think with the money, they were supposed to be mine. <laughs> <laughs> Since she left Romania, Nadia has made Venice Beach, California a second home, and there she and Bart fit right in. All right, let's go. Here we go. Come on. It's one. Two. That's six. Keep going. Hey. <laughs> Have a good workout. All right, here we go. Here we go. You know, she came to the States in 1989, and we started working together and, uh, and doing shows together, and we bonded as really good friends. There was no uh, interest in developing a relationship at the beginning. And, uh... <laughs> not from you. <laughs> I don't think that anybody here, not only in the States, but in the entire world, is no one person that doesn't like him, even if they don't know him. Because he just have that, you know, face, that you just look at him and you just like him. You just, you, you want him to be your friend. You know, when she first came here, uh, one of the big differences I felt between Nadia and me was the fact that I generally trust people. See, we have a, a way to say in Romania, and uh, you say, you don't even, you don't have to trust even your parents. At age 33, Nadia still bears the scars that come with being raised in a communist country. But through it all, she's endured to find a place she now calls home with someone she can finally trust. Even now, there's a lot of secrets. There's a lot of things she will never tell me, I'm sure. But I don't, I don't want to judge her by those. I, and I try to tell her, I love you anyway. I'll support you anyway, no matter what you say, no matter what you've been through. I'm doing my own little home movie. We caught up with Katarina at a stop on her skating tour going to be competitive to you, so you better be careful. You watch out. <laughs> she earns more than a million dollars a year and is looking to expand her career into television and film. She recently rented an apartment in New York City to be closer to where the action is. 
there was no question to go somewhere else than New York, you know, because it's so much happening here. It's the business, the entertainment, just anything. Hi. Katarina's come a long way from Karl Markstadt, but she remembers her roots. She recently flew her parents to New York to see her skate and has not forgotten her former coach, Frau Mueller. And I wanted her to be part of this world, you know. And then now here, bringing her to the tour, I, I invited her and I just wanted her to see what I'm doing. And to see her, how proud she was, it really was neat for me to see that. Today, Katarina's life consists of touring with ice shows and professional competitions. She's on the road eight months a year, which allows little time for a personal life. It is difficult in my position to, with this job I have, with the traveling I do, to really keep up a serious relationship. You know, it's just difficult to find somebody who deals with that. You know, I'm here, I'm there, I'm everywhere. I mean, every day I'm somewhere else. But don't cry for Katarina. She's doing exactly what she wants, and right now her greatest passion is skating. Sometimes now I do think back, and because I'm like, people come up and they go, like, you're still around. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously. <laughs> and I realize it's true. I mean, I've been at the Olympics in 84, and I mean, I've been like on a world level, like in 82, when I was second in the world, you know. But uh, I'm still going to stay in this business for a little while. I still like it. I still like to do it, you know, and I still feel that there are so many things I still want to accomplish. Today, for both Katerina and Nadia, the view is entirely different. For years, they were held up as symbols of communist success, political poster girls. The benefit of television is that we've come to know them in a personal way a precise child gymnast, and an alluring teenage skater who've now enthusiastically embraced the West. When we first saw Nadia in 1976, who would have thought that two decades later she'd be living in Norman, Oklahoma? Or Katerina, from behind the Berlin Wall to New York's Upper West Side? Like all great athletes, they made a difference. Both soaring figures of the Olympic Games, astonishing triumphs of the spirit, both sharing a passion to play.